Welcome back to Track Talk, everyone. I'm Scott Trey, along with Kirk Elliott. And joining us now is a, a guy that I enjoy listening to every day on Sirius Speedway, NASCAR Radio, XM Channel 90, Dave Moody. Dave, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, guys. How are you? We're doing well, doing well. And it could be a little bit better. We could be down there in Daytona checking out all the action that's going on. And uh, I want to start off with current events and what happened yesterday in the duels. And I think the biggest story that came out of yesterday was Danica Patrick's hit on the inside wall. And Dave, after watching that replay probably 20 times yesterday, I've been trying to figure out what was the greatest element of safety in that, but there's so many. You think about the seat, the head and neck restraint, the soft wall, the car, the way they crush up now and they disperse the energy more. It was accumulation of things that really allowed Danica Patrick to walk away from that wreck yesterday. Oh, you're exactly right. It's no one thing, although although every one of the things you mentioned plays a huge role. But, you know, it's it's like making a race car fast. It's not just one thing that makes a race car fast. It's a bunch of little things all put together. There's no one thing that makes a race car safe. It's a bunch of little things all together. It's, you know, the, the helmet technology, the head and neck restraints, the, the containment seats, the, the new car with a a larger greenhouse that has moved these drivers farther away from the door bars on the left side. Uh, the crushability, as you mentioned, of the cars, certainly uh, the, the safer barrier technology. Some, some people I know call them soft walls. I've never met a driver yet that calls them soft. <laughs> Maybe softer, softer but as, yeah. as Danica Patrick can attest, they're far from soft. Yeah. Um, some of the other news coming out of yesterday's event, I, you know, the second duel was, well, lackluster compared to the first. Um, but still a great finish in the second. Greg Biffle, though, are you a little surprised by the block that he threw on his own teammate there coming down for that white flag? <laughs> if I was surprised by that, I would have to admit that I know nothing about Greg Biffle. No, yeah. absolutely not. The Biff is as intense a competitor as you're ever going to find out there. He'd chop his grandma uh, to, <laughs> to win to win a, a you know a shopping cart race in the Piggly Wiggly parking lot. He's just, that's just the way he is. Yeah. Most of these guys, honestly, are that way. Um, you know, you're right. The second duel of yesterday was not as uh, as exciting as the first. You know, but there were a number of factors that went into that. I think we had maybe five or six guys that were on the go or go home list that had to race their way into that race. More than half of them were either in the garage and done for the day, or or a lap or two down by halfway. Uh, so that basically put it into the position where Dave Blaney and Joe Nemechek were the only two go-or-go-home guys that were still running on the lead lap, mm -hmm. and they really didn't have to get up there and fight with anybody to try and make their way into the race. They just had to be cautious, find themselves a good, you know, wide-open space of racetrack and keep themselves out of trouble. Yeah. What, um, what do you think uh, as far as Robbie Gordon's comments after yesterday – I, you know, is it his place to speak out? I know that he's struggling right now. His team financially is probably as thin as it's ever been. Um, but is it his place to talk about Terry Labonte getting in on a provisional? And doesn't Terry Labonte kind of earn that right because of what he's done for the sport and building the foundation of the sport? Honestly, I, I agree with Robbie Gordon. And to address your, your questions in order, I, I think he absolutely has a right to speak out. As, as both a driver in this sport and as a team owner in this sport, mm -hmm. he's got as much right to speak his mind as Rick Hendrick or Joe Gibbs or, or anybody else in that garage. I will say this, that, that I do agree with him, and, and I've never been a big fan of the past champions provisional. And, and in talking about this, I don't want to get hooked into saying anything bad about Terry Labonte or Bill Elliott or anybody else. Right, Love right. them, respect them. Uh, have you know great respect for what they have accomplished in this sport. But in my mind, who starts the Daytona 500 on Sunday afternoon should not have anything to do with what happened last year or five years ago or ten years ago or even 15 years ago. It ought to be about who came to Daytona with their stuff together and earned their spot in the Daytona 500. Now, you know, as long as the rules are what the rules are, Guys like Frankie Stoddard and Terry Labonte have every right in the world to take advantage of them to put themselves in the great American race. I do the exact same thing. But I don't think our biggest race of the year should be filled, even in part, on nostalgia. This is very much a what has done for me lately kind of sport, as in today. And, you know, the fact that, that guys were not able to go out there and race for a spot because it was already reserved for somebody that did something great 10 years ago. I just assume you're rid of that. I, you know, the past year, 
I was about it. It came along for Richard Kennedy when he was doing his farewell tour, and, and farewell was tainted because he couldn't make races. Right. And, you know, it was, it's hard to say farewell to a guy that didn't make a cut on Friday and is already at home. So they put in that past champions provisional, and for some you know, reason that I can only guess that it is still stuck around. I don't know that it adds much. I'd like to have one more spot up for grabs on, in, in the Gatorade duel if it's up to me. Yeah. Dave Moody is joining us. He's one of the voices you'll hear on MRN Radio's live coverage of the Daytona 500 on Sunday, beginning at 11 o'clock here on Sports Radio 810 WHB. Dave, let's talk about the race itself. Uh, there's been a lot of changes uh, to get these cars not to do the two-car grass. We're still going to see some of that on Sunday, but uh, what kind of a race are we going to see based on what we saw during the Bud Shootout last Saturday night and the duels on Thursday? I think it's going to be a little bit of a hybrid. Uh, you know, like you said, it's not been the straight two-by-two two this week, and I don't think it's going to be the straight two-by-two two on Sunday uh, because the rule changes that NASCAR has made don't allow these guys uh, to just tuck it up under the back bumper of the guy in front of them and push all day and half the night. Uh, so NASCAR's done a good job in breaking that up at the request of the fans. But as we saw yesterday with a lap or two to go, as long as it's still faster to push some guy, somebody, Guys are going to take a chance on doing that. So I think we're going to see a day filled with two and three and four wide pack racing. But at the end, the guys that are able to are going to join hands and find themselves a dance partner and try and shuffle their way to the front two by two. Does this lend it more to a veteran driver doing well? I mean, obviously, Tony Stewart's going to have a strong race car. Kevin Harvick's going to have a strong car, as is Dale Jr. Uh, do you see the winner based on uh, the type of racing that we're going to see coming from a, a group of veteran drivers more so than what we saw Trevor Bain do a year ago? Well, it, it may well be because, as you say, this is you know the driving in the packs is is a skill set and maybe even import, import, more importantly a mindset that some of these younger drivers have never really had a chance to work with. You know, there are things that you just cannot do out there now that you did without even thinking about a year ago. Uh, you know, bumping people on the left rear. We saw how that worked out in the Budweiser shootout. Uh, the answer is not real well at all. Didn't see much of that, if any, of it yesterday. So I think the drivers are adapting very quickly. They're, they're quick studies. They know now what they can do and what they can do. But you're right. There are some guys out there that have got a decade or more of experience of, of this pack racing, and there are some guys out there that have got less than a week of experience. So more often than not, you know the guy that's been there and done that. Dave, do you think a guy like uh, Tony Stewart, Carl Edwards, guys that are very comfortable sliding their car around and have great car control, Kyle Busch maybe the best at that, along with Tony Stewart, do you think that those guys have an advantage over some of the others? Well, I think it's going to be interesting to see on Sunday what exactly the track conditions are. There's no question if we were running the Daytona 500 today, that would be the case because the temperature is up around 90 degrees. It's hot, it's greasy, it's slippery, and the guy that can drive that thing like a World of Outlaws sprint car with its tail hanging out is going to have an advantage. Sunday's going to be a different kind of day. It's going to be about 20 to 25 degrees cooler than it was yesterday. That's going to change track conditions. Uh, it's going to enable these guys to push, I think, a little bit longer without overheating. So I, I think a lot has to do with good old Mother Nature and what she throws at us on Sunday. Yeah, let me ask you this, Dave. Uh, so much was made of the FR9 when it came into the sport about Ford and their their commitment to making these motors run cooler. We seen it as an advantage last year because they could put more tape on the nose of the car, get it to plant that nose a little harder in the ground. Um, and now we're we're talking about uh, less coolant, overheating conditions. I think Ford has to come and play with this new design on the FR9. Oh, there's no question about it. The, 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 the Chevrolet, uh, Toyota, and Dodge guys are struggling a lot harder with this new rules package than the Ford teams are, simply because, uh, you know, Ford Motor Company has the most recent rebuild of their engine package, mm -hmm. and, and a major part of that FR9, as you said, was, was more efficient cooling. Uh, and until, you know, General Motors, Dodge, and Toyota come out with uh, another new incarnation of their respective NASCAR engine package, which they'll obviously do in the next sure. couple or three years, I expect. Ford's going to have a little bit of an advantage in that department, and you can bet they're going to exploit it. Hear a lot of the other teams outside of the Ford camps lobbying for a concession on to keep these cars running cooler. <laughs> um, your thoughts on that? Yeah, big 
surprise, isn't that? No, isn't yeah. that amazing? Yeah, that, yeah. Isn't it amazing that the drivers and the teams are lobbying for changes that will allow them to shove each other longer and yeah. go faster? <laughs> exactly. Right? Right. That's always what race teams want, and that's always what they will want. And that's what they should want, because that's what they're paid to do, to go out there and go faster, longer. NASCAR's goal in all of this is a little bit different. Their goal is to make sure that we have a good competitive race that the fans, both in attendance and on television and radio, enjoy. Uh, and the fans were pretty clear over the last couple of years that that two-by-two stuff did not capture their fancy. Yeah. So NASCAR's role is to A, make sure everybody's as safe as possible, B, make sure we have a competitive race, and C, make sure that they're selling a product that the consumers, mm -hmm. the fans, really like. And based on the feedback and the ratings from you know, the racing that we've done so far this week, I think they've accomplished that goal. So I don't think you're going to see major concessions to the drivers and teams. Mm -hmm. There might be a little bit of a, a larger opening allowed for the Daytona 500. We'll wait and see. You know, I was growing up uh, watching NASCAR in the 80s. I was born in the 60s. We won't let that out, though. But I was, you know, really got into it after 79. Obviously, here in the Midwest, we were able to watch more races on TV after the 79 Daytona 500. And I was a huge Tim Richmond fan. I mean, just a huge Tim Richmond fan. And Kyle Busch, to me, reminds me so much of Tim Richmond in his several ways. Car control, um, his demeanor a little bit. You know, I'm sh I don't know if you ever met Tim Richmond, but Tim always, oh, yeah. he came off as a guy that liked to kind of rub it in people's face. And one of my favorite stories is a good friend of mine, Cecil Taylor, was standing with A.J. Foyt at a race one time. And Tim Richmond come walking up there, and they were talking, and a fan walked up and said, Hey, champ, can I get your autograph? Tim Richmond stepped in front of A.J. Foyt and signed the whatever they wanted signed. That was his mentality. You know, he kind of liked throwing a little salt in the wound. Kyle Busch, does he remind you a little bit of Tim Richmond? He does in some ways. I don't think it's his – I think Richmond, that was kind of intentional with him. I, yeah. I think – he really liked reminding people that he was the greatest driver he'd ever heard of. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and, and I think a lot of that was kind of a mind game with Tim as well. That, you know, much like Darrell Walter did when he first came into the sport, Tim realized that a big part of this deal was exposure and attention. And if you just kind of blended into the mob, you weren't going to get as much attention as if you stood out. So, you know, Tim would come in with the aviator sunglasses and, and the long hair and, and you know, Flamboyant. he dressed a little differently. He had a suitcase, you know, he had a briefcase in his hand. Uh, he was just a different kind of cat. And he, he exploited that and he realized that that was a positive thing for him. I don't think Kyle worries about any of that stuff. I, I don't think he, he, he worries a whole lot about his his reputation or his standing or how people think of him or what his media you know visibility is he just wants to drive the darn race car and and he is so focused on that that sometimes he says and does things uh, that get him in hot water with some mm -hmm. people but at the end of the day i really don't think kyle bush really has anything that he cares about other than strapping into that car or truck and going fast. So the only thing they had in common is car control, basically. Well, the only thing yeah. they had in common was what they're both tremendous wheelmen. Right, yeah. right, right. Last year, Brad Keselowski really burst upon the scene and uh, won a bunch of races, contended for a championship. Is there a driver this year that nobody is talking about that you think will emerge and be a championship contender? Well, I think his teammate at Penske Racing, A.J. Allmendinger, is the most likely guy for the job. Uh, I expect that he will win races this year. Uh, you know, in, in Richard Petty Motorsports equipment a year ago, he missed the chase by one position uh, and just a handful of points coming out of Richmond last year. So I expect A.J. Allmendinger to challenge seriously for a spot in the chase. I expect him to win races. And, uh, you know, if you look at that Penske Racing lineup with Allmendinger and Keselowski, they're good for about the next 15 years. They, they don't have to worry about anything. They've got two very young, very talented, very hungry drivers that I think are going to put them in good shape for a long time to come. Well, Dave, I, that, that's it in a nutshell right there. But, I, you know, I said that yesterday. You know, we were on one of the local radio shows here between the lines, and they said, who's a guy that you really need to pay attention to? And I said, Dinger. I said, you got to look at it. He just finished outside of the chase. He was starting to make big grounds over there at Richard Petty Motorsports, and now he's in a championship caliber car. And I think the one thing that people forget about that Penske organization is is that Dodge is full all in when it comes to commitment. 
to the sport, but they want to do it through Penske, and I think Penske has something in their corner having a manufacturer that is all in with just their team. I think huge advantage there. Yeah, you make a very good point that that all of Dodge's eggs are in one basket, right. and that's Ross Penske's basket. And that's not even a four-car team. It's a two-car team when it comes to Cup. So, right. you know, they may not have as big a pie in the game as, as Toyota, Ford, and Chevrolet, but they don't have to slice it as thin either. So Roger Penske, you're right, has the full attention and support of his manufacturer. Every bit of effort that Dodge can bring to bear, and it is substantial, goes directly into those two race cars. So I expect that team to be very successful this year. Are you in the business of predicting winners, Dave? No, because I hate being wrong. And, right. you know, <laughs> and, and I have found more often than not that when you predict who's going to win the Daytona 500, they don't. you spend most of your day Monday hiding from people because it's, it's virtually impossible. I mean, Dave Blaney nearly won the 500 a year ago. Nobody had Trevor Bain mm-hmm. on their radar to be a Daytona 500 champion. So try to predict this thing. It, it just doesn't pay. Dave, thanks so much for taking the time to join us on the show. I'm sure you're going to have the Daytona 5 winner on Monday. Would I be wrong by saying that? Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, we're sure going to try. I mean, we've got, you know, we, we've got Bagley and, and Castoni and, and Myers and Benjamin that want to wrestle us for them, too. <laughs> but one of the shows from Sirius XM NASCAR Radio will have the winner, and the rest of us will grab everybody else. All right, Dave. Thanks so much for being on the show and taking the time. Maybe we can touch base with you throughout the season and uh, – Maybe we'll look you up when you come to Kansas City. How's that? I look forward to it, guys. We'll do it again. All right. Thank you. And again, Dave Moody, you'll be able to hear him right here on Sports Radio 810 on Sunday for the Daytona 500. And uh, they do such a great job. and Can't wait to listen to it. And, of course, uh, you and I will be up here at Harris Casino at Sports 810 Zone watching the race up there. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, I will tell you – We've done a couple of these watch parties, huge turnouts, a lot of fun, a lot of hoot and hollering going on for their favorite driver, and it's always exciting. And now that they're pack racing, back to that pack racing, I look for it to be just intense at the uh, 810 zone at Harris. They're going to have specials there. You can uh, you can get – they've got a Daytona barbecue sandwich that uh, is uh, – they're going to offer you all day. They're going to have breakfast until – um, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They're going to have specials up there as well, so hang out with us, and uh, it should be a really good time. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll take your phone calls. 913-3810-810. Again, that's 913-3810-810. More of Track Talk with the Racing Boys. Brought to you by McCarthy Chevrolet when we come back. <laughs> 